Looked like uh, some of those panels still floating around there behind them, moving, of course, at 25,000 miles an hour, too. And those are the uh, thrusters of the action control system, those little, little bells there. Those are 100-pound thrusters. Yeah, it's right next to the quad. They're called I'll quads. I'll try to get a quick tear. We're, I may have to hold you up for a little bit here. Okay, John's going down to the LAB, and I'm going to the left fleet now. Roger, Tom. We're, we're standing by. They're changing seats again. Stafford's going over to the command seat, and Young is going back to the center couch. Those little thrusters are called quads because they come in clusters of four each. We'd like you to face the logic. That was one of the reaction control system quads you saw there at the last. We're coming back up here now with another pick. Altitude 6,469 nautical miles. Velocity 21,280 feet per second. Space navigation is in nautical miles, feet per second, rather than statue miles and miles per hour. I suppose someday we'll all have to shift over to that and begin to think in those terms. We've been trying to translate into miles per hour and statue miles which are the miles we know on Earth, and miles per hour, the thing we measure speed in most of the time, our Earth-bound existences. Charlie, you're going to have to look at the same picture for a while until we get this uh, target check complete. Roger, we understand you're busy. Uh, Leo Krupp out in uh, Downey, California, uh, what are they doing at this moment? Uh, they understand they're busy, and I'm sure they are, but just what are they doing? Uh, well, Walter, John's down in the lower equipment bay, and what he's doing is pressurizing the tunnel between the command module and the lunar module. He'll then remove the tunnel hatch, and he'll go up into the tunnel, verify that all 12 of the docking latches were automatically actuated, and they're all latched properly. He'll then take the umbilicals uh, from the lunar module and plug them into the tunnel wall so we have an electrical connection between the lunar module and the command module. He'll do those preparations, and then he'll come out and reinstall the uh, the tunnel hatch again. This is the hardest physical work of the whole trip, isn't it, Leo? Uh, no, sir. This uh, they will not remove the tunnel hardware at this time. All he'll oh, do that's is right. all he'll do is take the hatch down so he can get access to the umbilicals and check the latches. Uh, they won't remove the tunnel hardware, the probe and drogue, until after they're in lunar orbit. That's, that's the tough one. Yes, sir. Then they really are doing uh, manual labor. It seems peculiar in a way, and it's a little hard to explain, except it's uh, involved in saving weight and uh, a lot of other gear, apparently. But with all of this highly complicated uh, equipment, computerized, transistorized, miniaturized, uh, and all of this uh, in the space capsule, when they get down to this business of... Uh, of uh, putting these two spacecraft together and taking that uh, docking, uh, that, that hatch uh, out from between them, suddenly man has to get up there and that's young job. He rustles with it and pulls at it and tugs and yanks and finally moves it around and gets it back where he needs it so that they can open up the space between the command module and the lunar module for, in this case, Stafford and Cernan to... The latches. Uh, they won't remove the tunnel hardware, the probe and drogue, until after they're in lunar orbit. That's that's the tough one. Yes, sir. Then they really are doing uh, manual labor. It seems peculiar in a way, and it's a little hard to explain, except it's uh, involved in saving weight and uh, a lot of other gear, apparently. But with all of this highly complicated uh, equipment, computerized, transistorized, miniaturized, uh, and all of this uh, in the space capsule, when they get down to this business of, uh, of uh, putting these two spacecraft together and taking that uh, docking, uh, 
uh, that, that hatch uh, out from between them, suddenly man has to get up there and it's Young's job, he rustles with it and pulls at it and tugs and yanks and finally moves it around and gets it back where he needs it so that they can open up the space between the command module and the lunar module for, in this case, Stafford and Cernan to climb down into the lunar module and make their way uh, to within 10 miles of the moon's surface, which is the name of the game in Operation uh, uh, Dress Rehearsal, which is Apollo 10. The dress rehearsal to prepare the way for man to land on the moon in July. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. I'm Walter Cronkite, back here at the Kennedy Space Center at our CBS News headquarters for the flight of Apollo 10, a flight which is going exceedingly well up to now. As you have seen those remarkable pictures from space, and you're seeing one now from that new Westinghouse color camera, uh, we have seen the transposition, that is the command module leaving the uh, S-4B third stage of the Saturn, turning around, docking with the lunar module. It will be uh, ejecting the lunar module, pulling it back out and letting the S-4B be go on its way around the moon and out to the sun uh, at uh, 4.58 p.m. That's uh, another 40 minutes from now, uh, just about that time. Uh, meanwhile, they ride there, hooked up with the S-4B, taking a good look at the lunar module in its uh, garage and getting set for that uh, ejection uh, move. We uh, uh, are still hoping that uh, Eugene Cernan, with that uh, camera, will pan off and give us a view of the Earth from out there 10,000 miles or more away, as they are now, moving along at almost 25,000 miles an hour. Uh, he uh, indicated he was going to try that uh, a little earlier, and uh, he may yet. These fellows are giving us a lot more television than had actually been on the timeline and the schedule of the flight. As Tom Stafford had indicated, he uh, might. Uh, the, each transmission scheduled for around 15 and 10, or 10 to 15 minutes, and now this one already has gone on for 25, and they're still showing pictures. These, uh, the crew of Apollo 10 have shown a great deal more interest in uh, television from out in space than the earlier crews, uh, which show, seem to be a little bit reluctant in spending time with television. They had only the black and white RCA cam with which to work, but uh, uh, there was that uh, reluctance, notably, uh, it seemed to be, uh, noticeably, it seemed to be in the earlier flights of Apollo 7 and 8 and 9. But Stafford has said all along that the view from space is too terrific not to share with the people who are footing the bill. And he plans to show the blue globe of the Earth, uh, marbled in white clouds. And uh, uh, as Apollo 10 soars uh, away from the Earth and toward the moon, and finally we'll see that gray pitted disk that is the moon itself with that remarkable camera. Eugene Cernan said at one time, I've got a quote of his here, our feeling about this is that I could sit here and try to tell you what the color, uh, colors look like on sunrise and sunset, and you could attempt to picture them in your mind until you've seen them, until you've been able to feel them with your own eyes, you can't transmit it to another person. With this color television, we hope it will be able to do something that I think all of us in the program have wanted to do for a long time, and that's share some of the experiences and the things that are happening. Thanks to my over-enthusiasm, we're getting two thrills about seeing the uh, Earth from uh, outer space. I've had one already today. I thought we were seeing it when we were looking at that Saturn 4B third stage. It's like, and I even thought I could see the North and South American continents as I've seen them in my geography books. But it turned out not to be so. Looking at the S4B, the open end of it, uh, the top end, after the command module was separated. Looking back. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and suspend a TV here for about 10 minutes until we get a little bit squared away. Right, down the stand. Uh, we and, uh, we'll be back with you shortly. Roger. Gene, give me a call when you got time to copy an evasive pad. Okay, I will. It seems very possible that uh, uh, it's now not possible for them to give us a, uh, a shot of the Earth. They are docked uh, with the S-4B. Uh, their maneuverability is considerably limited at this point. They can't roll yaw pitch uh, with the command module to get a good look out of their uh, limited number of windows, the docking and rendezvous windows of the command module, and maybe they don't even have a shot at the uh, Earth at this time. I have a feeling that uh, Eugene Cernan and Stafford and Young would give it to us if they had it. Uh, they're busy doing some other things, some parts of the scientific 
technical things that are needed to get this flight uh, to keep it on uh, its true course toward the moon and uh, checking out systems for that uh, ejection of the lunar module. The, this is the first of 11 scheduled transmissions, more than we've ever had before, from a, a spacecraft. The next one is uh, planned for 4.03 tomorrow afternoon. Uh, although it's perfectly possible for these fellows to give us some ad lib ones, I suppose, on the way, they don't have a very full flight plan on their translunar flight, the three days out there, or the days actually coming back. Uh, a lot of monitoring of equipment, but not very much flying to do. Uh, they, that uh, transmission uh, tomorrow afternoon will be when they're about a third of the way uh, on out toward the moon. And then on Tuesday, the transmission scheduled for 6.48 p.m. These are all Eastern Daylight Time uh, figures. And then they'll be about three quarters of the way to the moon. Then on Wednesday at 1.08 p.m., it should be a right a spectacular show. They'll be just 20,000 miles from the moon at that point, uh, just three and a half hours from reaching the moon's environment.